Our Heavenly Father is always so faithful to provide a table before us and then provide a spiritual banquet on that table for us. Amen. That is the, the drink and the meat of his word that he sustains us with. Amen. We have to continually partake of him by the Spirit through his word if we hope to continue to live in our Christian life. I wonder if you'll turn over to 2 Kings chapter 5 for our message this morning, learning a lesson from Naaman. The first 19 verses of 2 Kings chapter 5, I've got a message this morning that the Lord's given me on some, some spiritual aspects of our lives that we can see here in the steps that Naaman took to receive his healing the various things that he did here in his life in these first 19 verses of 2 Kings chapter 5. <clears throat> this is a spiritual lesson that dates all the way back until the second half of the 9th century B.C. in Israel's history. So it's an old spiritual lesson here. As a matter of fact, before we actually get into our, our passage there in 2 Kings 5, uh, you might want to look in Luke 4. It's interesting that the only other account that we have of this particular Aramean captain or general is found in Luke 4, and it was used, among other things, it was used as a text for the very first sermon that Jesus ever preached. He knew about 2 Kings 5 and the great ministry of the prophets, the dual fiery prophets Elijah and Elisha, and what both of them did in their ministries, and although he certainly couldn't possibly begin to relate all the miracles performed by Elijah, or especially those performed by Elisha, he picked out one for each one of these fiery prophets to get across his point, and it was a rather difficult point. We see they tried to throw him off the brow of the hill. It was a difficult point that he was trying to get across to them, that is, his people, the people that he had grown up with there in Nazareth, and that point was that God just might have some more people he's interested in besides Baptists and Lutherans and Presbyterians. That, in essence, is what he was saying to them, because they were all Baptist Presbyterians. They were the church. They were the Jews. And Jesus said, God's, God's got some other people that he's interested in that aren't even in your church, and they didn't like that. Uh, verse 28 says they were filled with wrath. They rose up, thrust him out of the city, took him to a brow of a hill, and he had to work a miracle and pass right through the midst of them, or that would have ended a, uh, a very promising ministry. I mean, we know how promising it was, but of course it couldn't come to an end that quickly. That was the first sermon he ever preached. So don't ever get discouraged out there, dear friends. This is the Son of God. The Son of God on his first sermon. Uh, and he didn't seem to be too upset about it. He just goes right on preaching, gets down in verse 33, and starts casting demons out of people then. So he didn't let it bother him. Oh, yeah, he wept over Jerusalem. <clears throat> but he didn't let it bother him that people were rejecting him and were not receiving his ministry. Uh, but if you'll look here in uh, verse 24... Of Luke 4, this is the only other place that we find Naaman in the Bible. All that we know about him is found in 2 Kings 5. What we have here is simply a very small uh, repetition. It's condensed into one verse of the account in 2 Kings 5. Although all of 2 Kings takes up the account of Naaman, uh, the first uh, 19 verses uh, deal with his healing, and then we have some other problems in verses 20 through uh, the end of the chapter, 27. But anyway, Luke 4 and verse 24, and he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Why do you think we moved a thousand miles from home? No prophet is accepted in his own country. <clears throat> we wouldn't have been accepted down there because they'd be saying of us, and they'll still say it wherever you go. We're still in the same country, just a different region. They'd be saying of us what they said of Jesus. Oh, we know his parents. And wasn't he that little carpenter boy that grew up and we watched him when he was just a little lad? And who does he think he is calling himself the son of God? <laughs> we know his parents. 
And his parents weren't God. We happen to know that. Joseph was his father and Mary was his mother. And neither one of them fit the bill of being God. So what's he doing calling himself the son of God? Saying, I proceeded forth from the father and I've come to set men free and set the captives free. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, what they would say to him is what they say to us. Physician, why don't you heal yourself? Why don't you save your own loved ones there? He had a whole family of lost loved ones. They didn't say that way, though. You see, we get over to Acts 1.14, and we find out that he had some saved loved ones by the time we get over there. That's right. I'll tell you this. It uh, doesn't matter whether you can find a verse for it or not. It's true. Jesus never had a relative that didn't make it into the kingdom. That's right. You find a verse that says he did have a relative that didn't make it into the kingdom. Hallelujah. They said back in verse 23, Physician, heal thyself. Verse 24, no prophet is accepted in his own country for the reason that I just gave you there. They're too familiar with you. They already know you. You're not outstanding to them. You see, if an evangelist comes in town, well, it can happen even here. If some of you don't watch out, we don't allow other people to get behind the pulpit, but someone can get behind this pulpit, someone you'd never heard of before, you didn't know him, and you see, you get to know us. And we become, you know, you see us four or five or six <laughs> times a week, oh, all the man. time. Well, we know who he is. But you get, and I've seen it happen in other churches. You get someone else in there that the people don't know, and all of a sudden they look up to him as though he were God. Sure. Because, you see, they've never seen any mistakes that he's ever made. As far as right. they know, he's never made any before. Because he comes in on cloud nine and leaves out on cloud 18 and working yeah, miracles right, right. and everything. Yeah, sure. And they look up to him. But in, the, in your own country, it's a different thing. Then you've got, it may, it's more difficult then, because then it doesn't matter whether you stay, whether we moved away from our hometown or not, then the people have the opportunity day in and day out, month in and month out, year in and year out, of watching you. You can't do that to someone who just floats in all of a sudden Amen. and delivers an exciting series, an exciting compendium of messages, and then just floats out again. But when they are presenting you not only with their teaching, but their life as an open book and as an open teaching to you, then you can scrutinize things fairly carefully. It's always easier to criticize someone's life as opposed to what they say. Verse 25, But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Zarephath, a city of Zidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. <laughs> now you see what he's pointing to. The emphasis in verse 26 and verse 27 is that we have other people outside of the commonwealth and the nation of Israel receiving, well, you've got Elijah in verse 25, uh, in verse 26 with the widow woman, and she's got a resurrected son, and she's saved from starving to death. In verse 27, you've got Elisha and the healing of Naaman, and Jesus is taking this account, you see, of Second Kings 5 and applying it in a very hidden manner, although they saw it at the time, they didn't catch the, the full intent of what he was saying, that he was also sent with a ministry. It would be fulfilled uh, after his death, but with a ministry to the Gentiles. Hallelujah. Now, this is what he got from Second Kings 5. Now, as we've said before, uh, you see, there are, always, there are always deeper understandings and deeper truths in the Word of God. Uh, it's rare, uh, or it just doesn't happen when you go digging for gold that it's just lying all across the top of the ground there. <laughs> and you just go along with a vacuum cleaner and suck it all up, which is what some people would like to do. What do you do? About the best place to dig for gold or for diamonds uh, here in this country is down in Arkansas. And you pay so much, we started to do that one time, where you go dig for diamonds. And of course, diamonds, you don't find those laying on the top, and you suck them up in a vacuum cleaner. And we started to go, and all it cost was $2 for like a couple of hours. And there were things like five carat diamonds that had been found in this relatively small field. It was just full of diamonds. How they got there, no one even knows, because it's just full of diamonds. And of course, the people that own the property are just making a killing at it. 
because you don't find that many five carats. As a matter of fact, only one has been found there. <laughs> but what's that going to be worth by the time you get that thing cut? Of course, when you get it cut, it triples and quadruples in price. Too. A rough diamond is not too not worth much, which points to something else. Not only does it take time to get down there to the word, it takes time cutting it and molding it and cleaning it and polishing it and shining it to see all the facets in the diamond. You see, a diamond is just full of different facets, but it takes an expert to cut that diamond. And it, I mean, it takes an expert. And if you miss, then you've ruined that, that stone in. I mean, if you know anything, I don't know a lot, but I know that much about cutting stones. If you miss, that diamond's no good. You've ruined it. Now, someone like myself or you, we probably couldn't tell the difference. A piece of glass, a diamond, what's the difference? It looks essentially the same. Mm -hmm. But to the trained eye, they'll see those facets there. Mm -hmm. But how? Why? It's taken time to train them to be able to see those facets and for they themselves to be able to cut that diamond and get it in the place so that it would have the, the value and the worth that a cut stone uh, eventually requires whenever a person has taken time with it. We never did make it over to the field. It was a long drive, even though we lived in Tennessee at the time, it was a long drive over into that part of Arkansas to hunt. But people were always finding diamonds. Some of them would just be chips. But you know how much you can pay for just a chip of a diamond and an earring or a necklace or something. That just gets the thing expensive all of a sudden. And if you find very big chips, uh, then it really begins to get expensive. And they would let people come in and just dig and dig wherever you wanted to dig, hunting for diamonds there. But the point of the matter is you don't find any of these things on the surface of the ground. Mm -hmm. It takes more time. The same thing is true here with the Old Testament. The same thing is true here with 2 Kings 5. All you might get out of that is, well, Naaman got healed. But Jesus in Luke 4 got something deeper out of that. Mm -hmm. He got a teaching, and, and we're going to even expound more upon that because he could have said more than he said. But he got his teaching on the fact that the Gentiles also were to be saved. Even though that wasn't clearly revealed in the Old Testament, there are plenty of examples where we see this as the case, such as with Ruth, the Moabitess woman, and a lot of other examples, one of them being Naaman here. If you look down in verse 19, Elisha said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way, and then, of course, we know that Elisha's servant ends up catching up with him. People ask, was Naaman saved? Well, what does it say here? The prophet said, go in peace. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 says we only have peace with God by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. So to answer the question whether Naaman was saved or not, just take the prophet's word and take Jesus the fact that Jesus uses him for an example of a Gentile that, had, that was sent to a Jewish prophet and evidently received something worthwhile, something more worthwhile just than healing because that's what they had criticized him before just previously in the verses we didn't read there in Luke chapter 4. The works that you did in Capernaum, why don't you do them here? The healing works there. And he's pointing back to the salvation of Naaman that he received. So he, in looking back to 2 Kings 5, saw a deeper truth here that pointed to the salvation of the Gentiles. Now, turn back to 2 Kings 5, and we want to, I want to show you several spiritual lessons, some important spiritual lessons that we can learn from the account of Naaman here in these Hallelujah. first 19 verses. Verses uh, 1 to 7. We've got verses 1 to 7, uh, verses 8 to 14, and then verses 15 to 19. It's divided up well into three sections. Verse 1, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, or the king of Aram, they will call Syria later, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Aram. And he was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Arameans had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Aram said, Go to, go. 
and I will send the letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. Now this sets the scene for the story and for the account. We know that it's taking place sometime during the last half of the 9th century B.C., but we're not told the king of the Arameans, nor are we told the king of Israel at this time. They're simply both called the king. But since we can date Elisha's ministry, then we can put this within a reasonable framework of time. Now, some people would wonder, why give so much space uh, just excluding uh, verses 20 through 27, which go back and deal with Elisha and his servant, which, of course, both were Israelites, excluding that part of the chapter, you've got the first 19 verses dealing with nothing, at least on the surface, nothing but the healing of an Aramean captain or an Aramean general. Now, what does that have to do with the Old Testament or with Israel or with anything else? Especially, what does that have to do with anything of the New Testament where you've got so much space devoted to the healing of of this pagan, foreign, Gentile, unregenerate man outside of salvation, outside of the grace of God that was kept, for the most part, exclusively within the bounds of the commonwealth of Israel. Well, let's go back to verse 1 and see what we have. Now, you'll see a progression throughout the account here that will take as spiritual shadows the things that occur in the Christian's life and that no doubt at least some of them have occurred in yours. But there are some lessons to learn in what Naaman did right and in what Naaman did wrong. Remember, however, though, that we can't judge Naaman and his Old Testament ethics on the basis of New Testament standards. Naaman, uh, this was a great act of faith to do whatever he did, although there were some strange things in the account here. Naaman was under the Old Testament dispensation. We can't put back over on him and bind him with New Testament standards and ethics because then he doesn't quite measure up in a lot of different areas. Now, in the first verse, we have a man. And doesn't this look like all of you, or I could say all of us in time past? Naaman, he was the captain of the host. He was a great man. He was honorable. And he was a mighty man in valor. It's just like the Bible to begin the account of the man in presenting him as being everything and as having everything only to end the account, and the account so far is only in the first verse, but he was a leper. He's the captain of the host, he's a great man, he's an honorable man, and he's a mighty man in valor. But he's got one very serious problem. That is, he was a leper. And you see, all of us out in our past life, we were captains of the host. Some of us were great men. Some of us were honorable. Some of us were mighty men or mighty women in valor. But do you see, outside of faith in Christ and outside of his cleansing blood, we all were lepers at the same time. And we had the, some of us had, some of you might have had great standing and great prestige. And the Bible would start off your account with that. And everyone would think, oh, praise God, here we finally got the account of the perfect man. Until you get to the end of the verse, but he was a leper. It's interesting that one of the things he's recommended for, the third thing mentioned there, he's an honorable man because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Aram or unto the Aramean. Some of you are honorable because you were good in religious work. You were a captain of the host in religious work. You were honorable, you were a great man, and you were a mighty man in valor in religious work. But the whole time, outside of faith in Christ, there we all stand as a leper. 
It's like what Isaiah said over in Isaiah chapter 6. Whenever he saw God's glory there, God just doesn't recognize whether you're a captain of the host or the president of the company or even the chairman of the board. The president's not even the highest anymore. Now it's the chairman of the board. That's always the highest. God's not interested in things like that as long as the person is still in a leprous condition. Now, as you see, as we'll go along, faith in Christ and having his blood over you doesn't always take care of all of those leprous spots. I mean, there is such thing as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is such thing as the faith message. There is such thing as the message of total discipleship in him that even begins to further help in the area of getting those leprous spots off of the individual. But here's Isaiah in Isaiah 6 and verse 5, when he saw God's glory, then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Now, you know what that means. You know when someone's cooking something and you ask, Is it done? And if it isn't and you taste it, then you know that it was undone. It was not done. It was undone. Half cooked, something half cooked is not as good as when it wasn't cooked at all. I mean, some things you can eat raw and it tastes better than half cooked. And that's about how we all were. We were half cooked, but we were undone, though. You see, you didn't get all the way. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Back in Numbers chapter 5, you see, God had given the commandment and the condition to Israel that they put without their camp everyone who had an issue and everyone who was a leper. Amen. Leviticus 13 gives the whole account of discerning of the rites and the ceremonies necessary in discerning whether an individual was leprous or not. Now, evidently in Damascus and in the the state of Aram and the country of the Aramean, such was not the case because here we've got a captain and general of the host who's in very close proximity to the king of the whole country. But he's a leper. You couldn't do that in Israel. Jeremiah 13 in verse 23, the prophet tells us that in our own natural state, there's really not anything we can do about our leprosy. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? There's really nothing a colored person can do besides remain colored. I don't know where they got that name. We're all colored. It just depends on what color you are. We're all colored people, though. A leopard can't do anything to get rid of the spots. Neither can a leper do anything to get rid of his blemishes and his spots that he has on him. Oh, yes, Naaman was a great man and a great captain, but he was a leper. Verses 2 and 3, we find out that through God's providence, he's provided one who wasn't part of the bride, nor was the person, the spirit, but they were part of those that hear, that pointed Naaman in the right direction, although we see Naaman and his friend the king don't quite understand and don't quite do what God had provided for them in their prov- in his providence to be able to do through this little maid that had been taken captive by the Arameans on a raid. The, they had taken periodic raids into Israel and had taken a little maid captive, and she ended up, through God's providence, actually waiting on the wife of Naaman. This is all found here in verses 2 and 3. And she said to her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria for he would recover him of his leprosy now we taught a message we shared some spiritual things with you quite some time ago from Revelation 22 and verse 17 the three categories that we have here the spirit (coughs) tells us to come the bride says to come and then there's one group of people here in Revelation 22 17 that's not part of either of the two previous groups, it's simply that group that hear it. I mean, what's this maid doing a captive over in Aram when she's supposed to be an Israelite and believe in God back in Israel? But she had heard, though, you see. She hadn't received anything from the prophet herself, but she was one of those that hear it. She's one of those that heard about the prophet. And, of course, she's talking about Elisha there, 
And she's recommending to her mistress that Naaman go there, go to Samaria. Well, she said, would God that my Lord were in Samaria with that prophet, because surely that prophet would be able to do something about his leprosy. Now, you just don't get rid of leprosy. It has to be cured, healed, in other words, supernaturally. And so this is what she's pointing to. There's nothing he can do about it. Verse 17, Revelation 22, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come. He's the one that's supposed to respond to what the other three have said. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Now we see the subject of water also there in Revelation 22, 17. The same thing that we'll be finding back here in 2 Kings 5. Now, going along in the account and in the story here, I trust you're being able to follow along and, and you'll see more as we go along. Naaman does respond to what his wife has told him to do at the word of the little maid that she had waiting on her. And in verses uh, 4, 5, and 6, he has, it's been reported to the king, probably Naaman himself reported the matter to the king, but I want you to see what they do. Notice what the woman said, first of all, in verse 3. Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. <clears throat> verse 4, one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. The king of Aram said, Go to, go. I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. Now, she didn't say anything about going to the king of Israel. You see, the king of Israel, as the head of Israel, represents Israel as a whole. We're told over in Acts chapter 7, I'll have to find what verse, Acts chapter 7, that Israel was the church of the Old Testament. Verse 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. <laughs> well, I'm thinking ahead, so I know what the story's about. <laughs> so you see, what you've got here, they've completely misunderstood what she has said, or not misunderstood, they're disobeying what she has said. She said, go to the prophet and he'll recover you of that leprosy. So verse 5, the king says, the king of Aram says, well, let's send then to the king of Israel. In other words, Israel, he representing Israel, Israel representing the church of the Old Testament, it's just like the natural man of today, whenever he finds out that he's got some type of spiritual need, well, I better go to church then. Radio programs end <laughs> with, so many times, end with that ubiquitous phrase, and this weekend, be sure to attend the church of your choice. You've got a religious, you've got a spiritual problem. Go to church then. Listen, dear friends, that's the worst place to go whenever you've got a spiritual problem. Really? Amen. Because look back here in the book of Numbers. Remembering that, the, that Israel of the Old Testament represents the church, the church is the last place you want to be whenever you've got a spiritual problem. Numbers chapter 13. Uh, in verse 26, we've got the ten spies reporting back after their 40 days of scouting out the land. And God had said, go in, scout out the land. After they had wanted the 12 spies, the 12 men to go, we'll divide the land up, we'll go in and conquer the people. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel. Under the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation. told them and said we came unto the land whither thou sent us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it they're just getting the taste buds of the people watering now by saying what god said to us about the land is true it's certainly a land that's full of milk and honey nevertheless the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great and moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. 
Verse 1, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Turning over to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 28. Moses is rehearsing in his first sermon the same account. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. That's what you go when you, when you get to church. And if you, let's take, for instance, the matter of healing, and when you go into church, there are more people sick in the church than healed. That's certainly not a place to be if you're wanting to get healing or if you're wanting to learn anything about healing. Because the denominational, denominational church of our day is a bigger hospital than the hospitals are. Amen. Filled with blind, deaf, lame people. They have whole rows for the people that have walkers. That's right. And I'm not criticizing the people. I'm criticizing the denominational establishment and system that they set apart a whole row of people where God said, I set apart my son to heal those people. And they're casting him aside and behind their back, taking up their walker and sitting in on that row that's made for people with walkers. And we had a row at our church that was made for the deaf. And you had the whole row of little headsets there. And we used to sit back on that row when we were kids because you get to wear the headset on your head then. We didn't have that many deaf people in our church. But they had two whole rows, one on each side of the church, with your little headset for the deaf people to sit. And Jesus said, I came to bring health and healing to my people. And they're supposed to be getting it through the Word, and they can't even hear the Word. He said, I came so that the stammerers would speak plainly and so that the deaf would hear clearly. I mean, you've got Old and New Testament promises for that, that he'd loose the tongue of the stammer and that he would correct any problem in the ear of the deaf so that they could hear clearly, speak distinctly, see clearly. I mean, live just like a normal Christian should live, healthy, happy, and holy in their whole life. So they've misunderstood here, and they think that it's time to go to church now. So they brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Nahum and my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Now when we get down to verse 7, we've actually got them before the king, and what we have here is the equally ubiquitous response of most churches and most pastors whenever you come to them with a need. <laughs> it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? I mean, have you ever asked a pastor in the denomination of church, Why don't you teach us the word of God? Yep. <laughs> oh, am I in the place of God that I would know God's word? <laughs> Or why don't you preach on healing? Can we have a healing service with the anointing of oil and the laying on of hands for the sick afterwards? Yeah. Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? <clears throat> the church of Israel, the church of our day, is shirking their responsibility. They don't have any power to heal. That's right. And whatever you come to them, and if you come to them asking them, you know, for a social benefit, well, they'll give you a social benefit. But you come asking them for a spiritual, a sincere spiritual need that you have, and you watch your church. No, uh, we're not God. What do you expect us to do for you? <laughs> and that's what your pastor will say, too. I'm not God. What do you expect me to do for you? I don't have anything to offer you. He's right in saying that. Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and show how he seeketh a quarrel against me. All you people in our church talking about healing, you're trying to start dissension and quarrels yeah. in this church. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's just what the church of the Old Testament says. Yeah. The reason why they're coming, they don't really need healing. They really don't really want us to have a healing service. They're trying to start dissensions. They're trying to start a war here in the church. <laughs> Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider... I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. 
if there are any spiritual questions, if there are any important doctrinal questions that are brought up, then if they don't quote you page 14 of the denominational creed, then they'll give you this response, am I in God said that I would be able to answer a question like that. And they'll accuse you of trying to stir up brush fires there in the church and then blow on them yourself and get the wind going and get the fires going and try to start some dissension there in the church. So you see there, the point is they've missed what the maid had said to do. They've gone to church, and the church is where you don't want to go when you have a need. Amen. Now, that's with the exception of maybe one or two churches or, or three or four. Amen. But when we say church, we mean all the churches that are around. Now, the church is not where you want to go. You want to do what the maid said to do back in verse 3, would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria. Well, that represents the end time anointed prophetic ministries that God is raising up. Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria. And so this, God is saying, represents the, the end time prophetic ministries because you see, that's the only place that's offering anything to anybody today besides social programs and religious entertainment and secular business. Amen. Because we're coming to verses 8 through 14, the second section, and we see where indeed he does receive his healing. Where does he receive his healing? Is it in the church? He can't get anything from the pastor. The king doesn't have anything to offer him. But when he gets in the presence of Elisha, the true prophet of the day, then he's able to receive his health and healing. This, as I say, represents the end time ministry that God is raising up. And sometimes you have to go where they are. You see, the ministry here didn't come where the need was. The need had to go where the ministry was. The prophet stayed where he was. Uh, he did more than that. Verses 8 to 14 constitute our, our second section. In this, we see his healing, but let's take it a verse at a time and see the spiritual lessons. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, <clears throat> Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot. You see, we're back to verse 1. He's a captain, a great man, an honorable man, and a mighty man in valor. Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Now you've got two problems right here that you have to avoid in your Christian life, and this is what caught Naaman. First of all, you've got to guard against pride because Naaman in his pride didn't want to do what the prophet required of him to get the end of his desires and that was his healing he didn't he didn't guard against his pride he was a very prideful man a second thing you have to guard against is having your feelings hurt against what you might consider to be a lack of hospitality or a lack of courtesy Amen. now you watch this verse 10 he's outside Elisha's door He's got probably the greatest captain, the greatest general in the Aramean army. He's a friend of the king himself because the king's the one that sent the letter to the king of Israel. And he's standing outside Elisha's door. And Elisha sent a messenger out. Elisha doesn't even go out and grace him with his company. Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. And Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of Yahweh his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. You see, his pride kept him back at this point from receiving his healing because he wanted things done his way. Oh, come out and wave your hands, wave the wand over me, do something supernatural and something miraculous and the leprosy will go away. <coughs> and Elisha has something else he says go and dip in the Jordan River seven times you have to do what the prophet tells you to do 
That's the point. You have to do what the prophet tells you to do. And he says in the very first part of verse 11, surely, behold, I thought he will surely come out to me. You realize there's some people that just won't stay in a church unless the pastor greets them every time he sees That's them. Right. Yeah. And unless every time after they've done something for the church, he thanks them for it and then thanks them publicly for it. You've got people who simply won't stay in a church like that. Right. But I'll tell you what, this is something that you've got to understand and you've got to see. Sometimes the lack of hospitality and the lack of courtesy is done on purpose. Well, it's getting quiet now because you're listening. You want me to give you an example of that? All right, I'll give you an example. Turn over to Matthew chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. Dear friends, Jesus would have people come and lie down on their face and bow down their face in the dust before him, saying, Son of God, have mercy on me. You know what, dear friends? Those people always got their healing. I've been in meetings where I've talked before and people come up and you have to listen carefully. Maybe, maybe you'll learn something. People come up and, and stand there and ask for healing. But you know what? There have been about just as many cases of people who did receive as people who didn't receive. And it's not only during the ministry of Jesus, during the ministry of the apostles. What do they do? They lay them on the floor. They lay them on the street side. So that when Peter came by and his shadow touched them, they would be healed. Those people were acting their faith. Those people were desperate in having their needs met. Yeah. Some people, if, if, if they called over and said, would you pray for something? And I said, no, they'd say, well, okay, I didn't need to bother you and hang up. I'll tell you what, I haven't found anyone. I'm not talking about someone coming over and counseling all day. I'm talking about when you come over like they did with Jesus, they just speak the word. That's all I need. Speak the word and I've got it. Mm-hmm. But they'll beat your door down to get inside. Remember what they did in Mark chapter 2? They couldn't come nigh to him for the prayer. But they weren't going to be denied. <laughs> I heard of one fellow one time who someone was, came over his house who had a, a, a desperate uh, physical need. And uh, I don't know all the, the, the details at the very beginning of the story. I just know the ending. But evidently, no one was, was coming to the door. So he opened the door and went inside. He didn't even know the people. I mean, he knew of them, but he was, certainly wasn't friends with the people. He opened the door and went inside. They have a long haul uh, getting back to uh, where this particular brother was. And this brother has told before, he said, I, I, heard, I heard someone coming down the hall. All the doors were closed in the hall, knocking on every door as it came down, barging in every room as it came down. And finally got to my door, knocked on my door, and barged right in. And says, I, I've got to have my healing. If you'll lay hands on me, I believe I'll have it right now in Jesus' name. He said, he said you think I was upset with someone like that? He said, I've never seen anyone like that before. He said, do you think he got his healing? Why, certainly he got his healing. A man like that couldn't be denied. But some people, you know, you just, just show a little lack of courtesy or hospitality, and they get offended. You see, Naaman got offended there. Life has stayed inside send a servant out. <laughs> and a Naaman wanted, Naaman wanted Elisha to come out and wave a wand over him. Hocus, pocus, hocus, pocus. Amen. Poof, and there would be the miracle. So Elisha just stays inside, in bed, sends his servant out, sends his messenger out, says, go tell him to go swimming in the Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> and Naaman's offended at something like that. Verse 22, Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil, but he answered her not a word. You ever been treated by a pastor like that before? <laughs> well, there's the pastor of all pastors. He's the shepherd of the sheep. Hebrews 13, 21, 22 says he's the great shepherd of the sheep. There's your pastor for you. He didn't say anything to her. Didn't say yay or nay or hello or it's nice to see you today. Nothing to her. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. He answered, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. 
And he said, no. Read verse 26. I just summarized it for you. And he said, no. She says, I'll admit I'm a dog. And Jesus said, woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. God's trying to tell you tell you something right here through what we're saying and what we're saying. A faith that is not persistent and bold is simply not going to receive 90% of the time. Because 90% of the time it takes a bold and persistent faith. About 10%, you get your need met quickly, and it doesn't take a lot of persistence. It's just there. But who wants only 10% answers to their prayers when you can't have 90 or 100? The Bible says you can have 100. Hallelujah. The way you get 100 is always ask in faith according to his will, and then you always get your Amen. answer there. Now, he didn't say he'd answer you yesterday, though. Right. Amen. <laughs> People had yesterday faith. They had yesterday persistence. Right. They come up just as timid as a dog. Oh, I don't, I don't want to take any of your time. Hear me what I'm saying. I'm not talking about people who come for counseling. I don't want them to take my time. But, dear friends, we're in an end-time ministry here. Amen. The sooner you recognize that, the quicker things will start happening for you. Amen. Some of you don't recognize. Some of you don't recognize and appreciate that fully yet. Amen. We are in an end-time ministry and what God is doing here. Right. And there are other ones, but we're one of them. Amen. 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 That's fine. Thank you, Jesus. And you don't get you don't get your answers and your needs met going going to church, but you do when you go to the prophet in Samaria. Amen. 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 That's right. Well, let's go back to the account here. You think about that. I can tell when you're thinking because there are not a lot of amens in it. Just gets quiet. That's all right. Too. I don't mind if it's quiet as long as everyone's not asleep. <laughs> But if you're looking out there and writing and reading, but you're quiet, that's okay. I know you're thinking then. <laughs> if you're shouting, then I know you already know what I'm saying, so you're just agreeing with me then. <laughs> but when it's quiet, you're thinking, now, what is he trying to get across by what he's saying? Because I didn't just come out and say anything, but I got across what I was saying. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> well notice in verse 10 what the prophet requires him to do go and wash in the Jordan seven times Naaman is offended with his pride and he's also offended at the lack of courtesy that Elisha shows to him he thought that the man of God at least owed him his presence to at least come out of doors and greet him I've said it before. The Jesus of the Bible is not the Jesus of the denomination of churches. Amen. 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 And neither are the apostles. I mean, the apostles, uh, just read the book of Acts. We did 50-something messages on it. The apostles of the Bible aren't the apostles, the false apostles of today. I mean, Barnabas and Paul disagreed about something, and Paul said, well, then that's just too bad for you, Barnabas. Oh, but what about Christian love and unity? Well, Paul ought to know about it. He's the one that wrote all the epistles about Christian yeah. love and unity. Yeah. Yeah. But Barnabas disagreed with him, though. Yeah. You know what? We don't ever read of Barnabas after Acts 15. That's, right. Amen. That's the end of Barnabas in the Acts account. Am I saying anything by that? I'm just saying what the Bible says. It, it says no more about, about Barnabas after Acts 15. But it does say a lot about Paul all the way to the last yeah. verse in chapter 28. Paul's preaching the kingdom of God in the very last verses of the book. There's just more to an end-time ministry than you realize. You see, uh, we, we've warned you before, and we'll do more warning and teaching in the area of shepherdship. And some of you, uh, it's easy to get confused with the, the false concepts of authority and ministry that are propagated by the shepherdship teachers Amen. and what the Bible really teaches on the subject because they're very similar, very similar. And that confuses people. 
If you know anything at all about the shepherdship movement, you should be able to see a difference and a, a distinction between what the Bible calls and talks and discusses about authority and what the shepherdship movement okay. says about the same subject. They've got authority, and they'll let you know about their authority. So you, you see it's very similar. And there are some things that, um, well, take William Branham, for example. Uh, I don't personally agree with everything that William Branham ever said or that William Branham ever did. But William Branham never missed a word of knowledge. Hallelujah. Never missed one. And he gave tens of thousands of words of knowledge and words of wisdom to people. He stood up one time in his church. I've got some of his tapes, and I've got a lot of got all of his books. He stood up in his church one time. He, of course, this is Branham Tabernacle down in Jeffersonville, Indiana, right across the river there from Louisville, Kentucky. And um, uh, Branham Tabernacle is still there in Jeffersonville today. And the Branham followers are still there today. I got a letter from him the other day, signed by Branham himself. Of course, he's been, <laughs> <laughs> he's been there since 1965, though. <laughs> but, uh, of course, they're expecting him to be raised from the dead or, or to come back. I mean, they held him upstairs for a long time. That, that's another story. I'm not, I'm not saying that everything that Branham's followers ha have done uh, are right because uh, we had one of Branham's followers up here. This was several years ago that, that met me, that heard about me teaching in some meetings in Cain. He was from uh, Canada. As a matter of fact, he was out to our services, out to the church over at the old building uh, one time. I forget when that was, but this was several years ago. And we went out to dinner with him, and um, he was trying his hardest to get us, get us sold on Branham and on Branham's tape. Because, you see, Branham just had hundreds of messages then back in the 40s and 50s and the, the first half of the decade of the 60s. And you see, I already had some of Branham's tapes and his tape list and his books, so I already knew I didn't need to be sold on Branham. I already recognized that Branham was a prophet in his day. But Branham's not around anymore, though. And we got a letter just the other day signed by Branham telling us that we weren't supposed to be distributing any more of his tapes. And I haven't been distributing any of his tapes, but we aren't supposed to be distributing any more of Branham's tapes here from the Paradise. Have any of you received any of Branham's tapes from us before? <laughs> well, I don't know where they got the notion, but that was signed by Branham, by William Marion Branham himself. So he's been gone for a long time. Well, anyway, he stood up one time in his church and gave a word of wisdom. And uh, he had seen in vision, been seen by revelation. He didn't know where, but he knew that somewhere... Somewhere in the world, there's going to be a boy that died. And he saw the whole account, how the account happened and how the boy died. He was run over by an automobile. And Branham said, I'm going to raise that boy from the dead. And that wasn't the first Branham raised from the dead. He raised many from the dead. Now, he didn't go around raising everyone that died from the dead. He knew when it was God's calling and God's anointing to raise someone from the dead. Amen. And so he had this in vision, and he told his church and announced them ahead of time what I'm going to do. And I think it was two years later, uh, he had some crusade meetings set up over in the Scandinavian countries, I believe in Denmark. And after a meeting, he was being uh, driven home, and he saw the vision unfold and fulfill itself right before his eyes as he was driving. He was being driven along, and the car in front of him didn't see a little five-year-old boy that darted out into the street in Denmark. And they were going at a fairly good rate of speed, and the car hit the boy and just mangled him. And of course, he was killed instantly right on the spot. And Branham had seen uh, people uh, dead before, and he didn't always raise them from the dead. So you see what his ministry was about. Uh, as a matter of fact, I remember another time where this was back at Branham Tabernacle. Of course, he was the pastor there, although he was a prophet and an evangelist and a lot of other things. He was, he was the pastor there at Branham Tabernacle, and uh, he came into the service one day, and um, I believe his custom was to walk down the aisle and shake everyone's hand on the way to the pulpit like a lot of pastors do. So he was on his way down the aisle shaking everyone's hands and he came across a man and a woman with a little two or three year old child sitting there beside them uh, with his eyes closed very still and leaned over and said oh uh, what a pretty child that is and he touched the child and uh, the child was just stone cold and he said well that child's dead and the parents said that's right that's right uh, we're believing god to raise him from the dead here tonight and you know what Branham said? Branham says, I'm not having anything to do with that. Get that child out of here and get him buried immediately. 
You see, he didn't just raise everyone from the dead when they died. But anyway, getting back to the account, the story I was telling you, he saw this vision unfold right before him, and the car mangled the boy. He got out and laid hands on the boy, and it was a supernatural miracle. The bones came back together, and the flesh was all sewed back up, and the spirit of life came back into him, and he was raised, and it was in all the papers in Denmark. I've got pictures of it and newspaper articles of that account that happened over there in Denmark. So, you see, the, the ministries that God is raising up, and um, <clears throat> as I say, uh, there were areas where, where Branham's teaching was simply not in line with the Word of God. Now, there are some people that differ with me on that. There are some people that wholly follow everything that William Branham ever said. Uh, I don't talk against William Branham. Uh, for one reason, he's already dead now, so there's no sense in criticizing William Branham. And secondly, I don't talk against him because his ministry was the proof of the pudding. Someone who never, you see, a false prophet always misses it somewhere. I mean, in his, in his revelations and things, and Branham never missed it in his word of knowledge. He was always correct in every single disease that he diagnosed by the Spirit and by a word of knowledge. He would call, have people come up to the platform and he would just touch them and know what their disease was already. And they would have it written out on a prayer card. And he said, I don't have to see the card. I can tell by the Spirit what your problem is and what your need is. And he told more than one person their telephone number when they wanted proof of his ministry. He said, well, I'll tell you your telephone number then. And he had reeled the telephone number off for him. And, I mean, when you're in a foreign country, I don't even know how many digits they have in a foreign country. How do you know how many digits to guess? <laughs> I mean, what, what are the odds of ever guessing it right? <laughs> even if there were only two digits, what are the odds of guessing two of them right? Or one of them? You got from one to nine just with one digit. <laughs> I mean, you probably wouldn't get it even then. Well, Elisha said to him, Go and wash in the Jordan. Come back and you'll be made clean. Naaman is offended for the two reasons. Verse 12, he said, Are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Now what you don't want to do is when God, through his word, presents something to you that might be different than something you've heard before, or it might be different than what you are doing now in your life to turn away in a rage and leave the Word of God. There's where your pride is involved, friends. You have to be, be willing to admit, well, I was wrong there. But I want to know God's Word, and I want to know God's will. And if you want to, then He'll reveal it to you. The biggest thing that you'll ever do in your life is come to the place where you can admit that you're wrong. Yeah. Can everyone say amen to that? Amen. That's right. That's, that's one of the biggest steps you have to take as a human being. To say, I'm wrong. But I'll tell you what, a person that can't say they'll never make it into the kingdom. Just to get saved, you have to say, I was wrong about Jesus. I changed my mind about him now. That's what gets you saved, is to have a change of mind and a change of heart. But it doesn't stop with salvation. Every other thing that God tries to teach you from his word. He's not sharing these things with you for your harm, friends, but for your benefit. Amen. That's what we're told back in Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. Moses said, I've given these commandments to you for your good. Not for my good or for God's good. God's as good as he can be. He doesn't need your goodness to help him get any more goodness for himself. But he gives these things for you so that you can be partakers of his holiness and partakers oh, of his righteousness. That's what all the divine, the exceeding great and precious promises are for. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. That's why he's given you the great and precious promises, so you can become a, divine, a partaker of the divine nature Amen. and escape Amen. the corruption that's in the world that comes by means of lust. So what he wants to do is, I want to turn away now, and I'm going to go to Abana and Farpar. What do people do today when they're presented with something they don't want, they don't like, that disagrees with them, and with which they disagree with? I think I go back to Abana and Far Park. I'm going to return to Abana and Far Park. Uh, Samaria and the prophet of God, that's too much. But if we go, and, and Jordan, you see, he said go in Jordan. And Jordan's not, I mean, the most beautiful river in the world. That's why he said, aren't there better rivers in Damascus and all these muddy waters in Israel? And he names two of them. 
verse 12, Abaddon far apart. He said, aren't these rivers, these are rivers in my own capital, Damascus. Aren't Abaddon far apart? Cleaner rivers, prettier rivers, better rivers with more healing virtue in them <laughs> than the old muddy Jordan here? <laughs> you got to beware that the devil doesn't put in your mind it's time to go back now to Abaddon far apart. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we could have named the message that because that's what people do. They go back to Abaddon far apart. Hallelujah. Because the devil, sure enough, will put that in your mind. It generally comes after a teaching where you heard something to do that you don't want to have to do. That's right. So the devil begins to put in your mind, well, it's time to go back to Abaddon and Far Par. Abaddon and Far Par are a lot better than here. They don't require things that Jordan requires. Does he? <laughs> so you see the whole message. You see the spiritual principles that, that are contained here in Naaman's account. Well, he had some wise servants with him. Verse 13. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. I'll climb Mount Everest and I'll swim the English Channel. But wash and be clean, that's too easy. That wasn't something difficult to do. That's and, he, and the, his servants are smart enough to realize uh, all that old adventurous religious spirit in them and just give me some religious works that I can do and I'll go do them to get healed. Right. But go take a bath in the Jordan? <laughs> How disgusting and disgraceful. What does God require? Look in John chapter 15. And verse 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. First uh, Peter 1, 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Then over in Ephesians, one other verse over in Ephesians, or several, Ephesians 5 and verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the assembly and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it Amen. with the washing of water by the word, Amen. that he might present it to himself a glorious assembly, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. What's going to do it here for Naaman? Then went he down, verse 14, and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Jesus said, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse you with the washing of water by the word. It's no longer physical water. Because it's not a physical disease that you have, friends. Amen. And it takes the Word of God to wash these leprous spots away. Amen. Notice what happens to, to Naaman in verse 14. He has complete restoration. What you see in verse 14 is, is the salvation experience. Jesus said you must become as a little child to enter into the kingdom of God. He's got his flesh which came again unto him like the flesh of a little child. In other words, what he's saying is he's just like he's born again. He, that's the only way you're going to get leprosy taken off of you is to be born again. I mean, in more ways than one. To be born again because you've got to have your flesh restored like the flesh of a little child. Now, you see, that can apply to salvation, but that applies, of course, since we see in the New Testament in, uh, well, we saw there in First Peter 1, some of you might not have made it there quickly enough. I read all three of them quickly. First Peter 1, 22, that ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. And then he goes on to say, but you were born again by the seed of God, which is the word of God. That is the truth. Amen. The word of God is the truth. And a person, though they might already be born again, and even have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the only thing that's going to wash and keep those leprous spots off of them is a continual feeding and feasting upon the Word of God. Amen. And you see, you can't turn away from the very waters 
that are going to take care of those leprous spots on you. You see, that's what Naaman was turning away from. The very thing he came and asked for was healing. But that's the very thing he turned away from when it was presented to him in a different way than he wanted it to be presented. Uh, that's what's amazing about the whole account. He wanted healing. Elisha offered him healing. But he presented it to him in an unconventional, non-denominational manner. He wanted to go back to Abana and Far Park. But when he presented to him with the Jordan River, and seven times in the Jordan River, and then you'll be clean. You'll have the very thing for which you came. No, he turns away in a rage then. You see, first of all, he wanted the, the wand to be waved. And when he saw that wasn't going to happen, he at least wanted to go back to Abana and Far Park. And Elijah said, I won't allow you to do either one of those. We'll not have either one of those. And some of the times, that's, that's the way it ends up with you. Well, I know the answer to this question. It's either this or this. And it's neither one of them. It's not the one and it's not far apart. It's neither one. And you have to be careful in turning away when something is unconventional and non-denominational. Turning away in rage and pride, just like Naaman did. Well, now in verses 15 through 19, we're going to have to read through these verses so you'll see what Naaman does here. And, and this is where I, where I have to interject the statement that we can't criticize and tr critique Naaman's life on the basis of New Testament standards. He returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. And he said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. And this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing, and he said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. In other words, what he was saying to Naaman is, Yes, you'll be pardoned for that. Because Naaman is not going to worship any other god. Uh, but you see, the thing is, he is uh, a servant to the king here. It doesn't mean that the king literally leans on him, but he was to carry about some type of ministry as far as the king was concerned whenever the king went in to worship his false god, Rima. And so Naaman asked, Will the Lord please forgive me because I... He doesn't come to Israel uh, like uh, uh, a Ruth did. He's going to stay in his own country, but he's not going to worship any other gods except the one true God. But what he does back in verse 17 is what's interesting. He wants to take two mules' burden worth of earth back to Damascus with him. Now, of course, you realize why he wants to do that. It was the belief that well, verse uh, 15, there's no God except the God that's in Israel. So if I have some of the dirt from Israel back home, then God will be with me back home. So you see, you can't criticize his understanding. He didn't understand a lot of things. But at least he got his healing, and there are Christians, thousands of them, dying out there and not getting their healing. Yeah. At least Naaman was, was, had enough sense. It took him two tries. But at least he had enough sense to go back and receive his healing from the prophet, from the man of God. Now, what the warning, what the spiritual warning that the Lord gave me from these verses is, you can't take a little bit of end time prophetic truth and take it back into the denominations with you. You have to stay out of the denomination and stay out of her web and stay in the promised land. But you see, too many people today are getting a little bit of charismatic truth. There are some of them getting a little bit of end time prophetic truth. They're getting about two mules worth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's not very much to live by. They're getting about two mules worth of end time prophetic truth or of charismatic truth, and then they're carrying that back with them into their denominational system. What he's going to do now is build an altar from this so he can offer sacrifices and worship God uh, as Exodus 20 said they should have to do. 
So what they're doing is going back into their denominational system, or they're going back into their charismatic system. It's still a system if it's a charismatic denominational setup and framework, but they're carrying a little bit of that end time prophetic truth with them. They're going to try to build a little altar and worship God right in the midst of heathenism and paganism. And you see, that's not going to work for you then. Oh, it worked for Naaman back there, but it won't work for you today. He didn't have the understanding that we have with the New Testament today. All he had heard is by word of mouth from someone that heareth, the little mate, that there was a prophet that could recover him from his leprosy. So he's doing a tremendous deed of faith by going over to his arch enemy, the Israelites, Remember, the Arameans are the ones who had captured this little maid from Israel. They were making raids on the country. So he has to go over to his arch enemy, and that's a great step of faith in the very beginning for him to be willing to go over there and go to what amounted to be in verse 8 after Elijah requested this from the king, that prophet from Samaria, <coughs> to receive his healing from them. But the area is keeping denominational truth and denominational doctrine in your mind. You may not even go back into the system in the body, but you're there in the spirit. And it just shows up in people's lives. They're not there in the body, but they're there in the spirit. They've never gotten out of the web of denominationalism. They're not there physically, but they're there mentally. They're there in their understanding of the scriptures. That's where they still are. They're back in denominationalism. They're back in Damascus. And the deception and the thing that you need to be warned against from Naaman's example is getting just enough of that end-time prophetic truth and then trying to go build an altar in the land of Babylon with that truth. It's not going to work then for you, friends. And there are too many charismatics out there that need to be warned of this. It's simply not going to work. To take two mules' burden worth of earth that's not going to be worth a lot by the time you get back to Babylon and build your altar there. Right. You've got charismatic truth. You've got Bible truth. You've got scriptural, biblical principles and doctrines within you. But then you're going back and building. Now, we see in verse 19 that the prophet told him to go in peace. So the only thing we can take from that, it's a very interesting account here, you see. Uh, but the only thing we can take from that is is that what he had requested in verse 17 and in verse 18 was granted to him by, by the prophet. Namely, that he had given him the earth so that he could go back and that God would forgive him uh, while he still uh, walked and worked, although he didn't worship in this temple of Rimon, uh, because that was his king there. Uh, let's go over to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, to read this very familiar passage, Uh, verses 11 through, well, I don't know. We'll just read Ephesians 4 and verse 11. You see, we're always talking about the Word. I mean, we can't be criticized for talking about tongues all the time or something. <laughs> uh, tongues are a blessing, but tongues aren't what will give you the victory all the time. Yeah. The Word of God is what gives you your victory. And when you can stand on the Word and the tongues are a blessing, Amen. to go along with it. If you're not praying in the Spirit every day, you ought to be praying in the Spirit every day. But it won't really do you a lot of good if you're not walking in the light of the Word of God. Amen. Because then you're trying to use some shortcut <coughs> shortcut into getting into God's blessings and getting into the, the realm of victory. Amen. There's no shortcut. It comes by faith in the Word of God. So we put a lot of emphasis on the Word of God. That it's John 15, 7, that if you'll abide in Him, and let his word abide in you. Then you can ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. That's for you out there, dear Christian friend. When you've got a need, if you're abiding in him, and his word is abiding in you, you can ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. God's really not concerned about what you ask. because Why? Because when you're abiding in him, and his word is abiding in you, you wouldn't ask anything contrary to his will. Oh, You'll be in his will. He doesn't care what you ask then. He doesn't matter what you ask. If you're abiding in him and his word is abiding in you. That's John 15, 7. It's as true today, dear friends, as it was back then. 
regardless of what people say about Jesus, didn't have a place to lay his head. I'm sorry about the fact he didn't have a place to lay his head. That doesn't alter the truth of John 15 and verse 7, though. Doesn't matter if Paul said in Philippians 4, I've learned to be content in whatever state I am, whether I've got needs or whether I don't. That just doesn't matter. Now, you see, when you're willing to take God at his word and not try to dream up a lot of denominational arguments on why the promises won't work, then God will bless you with some understanding of passages like those. And you'll find out they don't mean what you think that they mean. But you first of all have to confess that John 15 and verse 7 is true. It doesn't matter. And I say this in all due reverence and respect. It doesn't matter whether Paul got his needs met or Peter got his. God said you can get yours met. Amen. By John 15 and verse 7. Abide in him, have his word abide in you. And you can ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, I hope that you're hearing both of those conditions. The promises are without exception, but not without condition. If you're hearing those conditions, dear friends, and you're meeting those conditions, beloved, in your life, then that promise is for you. That you can ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. That's an unlimited promise, but not unconditional. And those conditions are what we're talking about right now. And what we're fixing to read about here in Ephesians 4. That's why the ministry is so important. That's why the Word is so important. And that's why it's so important you get here on a morning like this morning. I know it's a blizzard out there this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. But look at here. Everyone's here. The whole place is here. Praise God. Praise God. You had to come through a spiritual blizzard to get here in the first place. So a natural blizzard is nothing to get through. So you can always just get out and start walking. But there's really not anything you can do about those spiritual blizzards except by the grace of God that you ever get out of those things. A natural blizzard is nothing. Like I say, you can just get out and start walking and make it here. doesn't matter whether the car went in the ditch or not. You could uh, ride a snowmobile here or something. Or get on a sleigh or something. That's what we always saw down south. And we didn't see them, but we saw them on commercials. But that's what people up north rode around in, sleighs with bells on the horses. <laughs> <laughs> and see, there are stereotypes everywhere, you know. <laughs> you probably got false concepts about the deep south. And yeah. we, we had false concepts about the deep north, too. <laughs> but everyone rode around with horses that rang little bells on them. <laughs> that wasn't only at Christmas time we saw those commercials, either. That was all the time, people riding around in those sleighs. And I haven't seen one since I've been here. <laughs> but uh, we've seen a lot of those snowmobiles. I've never been on one of those things. Uh, I'm not saying I'm afraid to get on one or anything. It's just that there are other ways to travel besides uh, <laughs> getting on one of those snowmobiles. <laughs> but there are some things you probably hadn't done that we do down south, so don't you criticize me and I won't criticize you. <laughs> You've never been on one of those boats that um, goes across the top of the water, you see. So you do that down south where you've got an open lake in the Everglades and you just glide across on air as you go across the water. And those, uh, those are pretty interesting. I don't guess those are any more, um, uh, can I use the word dangerous, than uh, those uh, snowmobiles that people ride around on. <laughs> Probably about the same. I don't know. Well, Ephesians 4 in verse 11. This, is, uh, this contains those conditions that we just said in John 15 and verse 7. Abide in him and have his word abide in you. Uh, as a matter of fact, you first of all got to have his word abiding in you before you know how to abide in him. Because it's his word that teaches you how to abide in him. So you've got to have his word abiding in you. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, uh, even Christ. Uh, then if you'll look over in uh, 2 Peter, second Peter and 
2 Peter chapter 3. In the last two verses here. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 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 Well, Father, we thank you for your word that washes us clean every whip that restores our youth like the eagle, that restores our flesh like a little child, that renews us in our mind, Father, that renews us from the inner man to the outer man, that as we are renewed by your word, then so at the same time are you taking us further and further in your grace and in an understanding of your grace and of all of the, the storehouses of truth and of revelation that you have for us to receive. We pray for your grace to receive that truth and not to turn away our hearts when we hear something that's presented that we think is contrary to the way in which we would like, but that we will come humbly before your word, before the table that you have provided before us, and drink of the water, and eat of the bread, and taste of your word that never passes away. Amen. And we thank you, Father, for that grace that we receive every time we hear your word that the blessed holy spirit performs his ministry of convicting sinners and convincing our hearts that god is a god of truth and that his word is true and that you said what you mean and that you've meant what you said in your word and that if we will only but take the limit off our prayers and ask for what we will then it shall be done unto us in Jesus name for the Lord does say that I am not a man that I should lie neither the son of man that I should repent but if I had spoken something to you, my people, then I'll be sure to bring to pass what I've said to you that I will do. If you will trust and obey, obey my word, obey the calling of my spirit, and trust completely in me, then you will see the fulfillment. And I tell you now, ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. If you do not ask, then you've got no way that I can fulfill my joy in you by fulfilling your joy, in answering your prayers to your own joy and to your own delight, so that you'll see that there is no God but I, and that I am your God, and that you are my son and my daughter, that I hear your prayer as it's prayed in faith according to my word but i admonish you only pray in faith because whatsoever is not of faith i say unto thee is sin in my eyes but as you pray in faith then the windows of heaven will be opened your mouth will be filled with joy and gladness your needs will be met you can take your heart down from the willow tree and begin to sing again as I restore thy youth like the eagles, saith the Lord.
sister, have you heard? To him that lives and overcomes, will I give the bright and morning star? Have you heard? 